glad to know you're still there. Um, it's so unfortunate we couldn't bring you the papers today, but the papers are looking good. So uh, find one, grab one, and see if you can see what the headlines are. Um, we're moving from, uh, from glory to glory as it is in some sections, while in some others we still need to grow a lot. But right now we're going to be looking at the security situation as it concerns 2024. What are the things that need to be put in place for security to be top-notch? Uh, as we enter into the new year. Remember that today is 30th of October 2024. If it were uh, one of those other months, it would have been the last day of the month. But uh, this is October, so we're still having one more day. And then we are entering November. Before you know what is happening, uh, then uh, it is Christmas and then it is the new year. We begin to make resolutions that sometimes in the middle of January we just jettison and continue to live our lives because of the situation and the reality on ground. The other day I was passing through a, a street and that was early October and they were already doing uh, Christmas decorations and one of the people inside the car that uh, we took was like, oh boy, it's December that time already because even once we begin to see this, you know that the responsibilities that come with December or the end of the year are upon you. What have I really done? <laughs> you know. So instead of rejoicing that you're going to have Christmas, some people are afraid that the time is coming too soon. But hey, it will take 365 days for Christmas to come after the last one, you know. But life happens, and we do hope that we are going to round off this year in style. Okay, we're going to be talking security, like I said, and we're glad to be joined by a security expert, Mr. Augustin Agbe Ega. Good morning, and welcome to the program, Mr. Ega. Good morning, Yambo. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, for a while now, the present administration, in fact, every administration has been trying hard to make sure that uh, they make the arsenal of uh, our security agencies to be richer. Because sometimes we have firepower uh, from the bandits, from the terrorists, from all the people that do unwholesome things, being superior to what we have as a country, you know. So we try to upgrade and all that. But as we... we we have seen in the past, it doesn't seem to be making so much uh, impact on improving the security situation in our country. So today, we are concentrating on what beyond the uh, weapons that we buy should uh, the security um, agencies, the government and whoever is concerned be doing to make sure that our security is better. So we're looking at 2024. The new administration has just won the case in the Supreme Court, so it's time to concentrate. What are those things that they need to concentrate to make sure that security is top-notch in 2024? Let's begin there. Uh, thank you, Nyangu. Uh, I think um, uh, so far the, the, the current administration have been looking at every area to better the Nigerian the, uh, society. We should understand that the social welfare also has a lot of impact in the security of a nation. If you are having difficult times in a nation, it will also reflect on the security situation. So as much as they plan to buy uh, sophisticated arms, they should also work hard in trying to revive the economy of Nigeria. That will go well to even uh, bring down the security situation to a very uh, low level. And uh, as we say this, it is not out of place for them to also buy uh, new arms, uh, especially when we look at security, we look at the national security and we also look at the international security. These are external factors that affect the national security as well. Currently, we have the Israel, Israel and Palestinian the armed conflict going on. And we know that this also has an impact in the internal and national security of Nigeria. Why? Uh, because uh, uh, some people who perceive uh, Israel to be a Christian state and a Palestinian and Muslim state, especially I'm talking from the northern Arctic, they will run to quick conclusions that it's a religious conflict. And what we will see in the north that you see people carrying uh, arms by any means in the disguise of terrorism and all that to start fighting innocent souls and killing people. 
We have that experience when we had um, the Islamic State in the current Iraq. We know that that also influenced even the, the ISWAP in Nigeria. We also have an incident um, that uh, we, uh, uh, like what we have currently now also at Niger. The military government is in Niger. We know that they will not take no sense from uh, any uh, uh, criminality. So it means that they will be strict in all criminal uh, issues. And if Nigeria is a safe heaven, they will find themselves in Nigeria. So as much as they buy arms, I also feel that it's important uh, for the government to strengthen its border control, immigration, the custom authority, that should do a lot to control uh, the border movement, because this is where all the, uh, the threat will come in. Okay, I, I don't know. Intelligence gathering has always been a problem in Nigeria. At least that's what is perceived, that it's been a problem in Nigeria. If you agree to that accession, what do you think should be done uh, to get this intelligence gathering to where it should be? Because I don't see any security um, succeeding without proper intelligence. Well, uh you, you, you cannot deploy. You cannot deploy uh, security uh, uh, manpower without intelligence. Intelligence is something that it goes around the cycle, like especially the DSS are in charge of the internal intelligence. And of course, every other law enforcement, they have intelligence units. And so they, they, play, they play a critical role in ensuring uh, that strategies are built in that will be cost effective. So intelligence cannot be ruled out. As much as you raise that, it should also be increased. And of course, they are doing a lot. There are so many uh, threat issues that uh, even they don't bring to the public knowledge. But they just, uh, to avoid fear, to avoid panic, uh, they just try to kill it within their own uh, domain. So uh, in terms of intelligence gathering, I can see that the Nigerian intelligence, that they are very strong. The DSS and all of them, immigration and the customs and the uh, civil defense, all of them, they work very hard to ensure they get, including the military. So they share all this information, this speech within themselves. So uh, that is already something that is in place. Uh, but intelligence is not enough unless it's actionable. When they receive this, they should not just receive it. There should be steps to use it appropriately to protect the citizens. Mm. Okay, but... Maybe we were wrong by thinking that because since they don't bring some of these things to public knowledge, they might be doing uh, their work diligently. The only proof, or, or you know, it depends on where you're standing, is is that uh, we see situations where uh, because anything that has to do with uh, security or has to do with arrest is also a security issue. We see so many times where people. Uh, get arrested on very frivolous things and then get detained for so long and then use that time when they are, they are detained uh, to do investigations. For a people that have a good intelligence unit and a good intelligence network, this shouldn't be the case. So we tend to feel that the intelligence gathering is not good enough. That's why things like this happen. Or are there some cases that you do not need intelligence before arrest and you arrest before you begin to gather intelligence and information to uh, prosecute that person? There is no arrest without the uh, background information. And for the fact that the, a person has been arrested does not make the suspect. He's still a suspect. He has not been convicted. So uh, it depends on the background information that the law enforcement will receive that they will commit to an arrest. And when they arrest, it is still not out of place to ensure that they do accurate due diligence before they can release uh, such a suspect. So wherever, wherever is the suspect in their own neck, it's only a suspect. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in every guideline, they have their, their rules of engagement. And these are rules of engagement I think we should try to understand from the public angle. Rules of engagement is something they know within themselves, just like you have in your every organization. They know, they follow their rules of engagement before they commit to any arrest. Mm. 
So, okay, now, a lot of people are saying that um, devolution of powers is a very, very critical thing if we need to move on. There are some things uh, that have been concentrated in the center, so much so that it is affecting the other parts of the center, like uh, security. There's so much that is concentrated on or in the center that uh, it's, it's difficult for states and local governments to to do the needful when it comes to security. That's what uh, so many people have been saying. Is that a true assertion or assessment of the situation? And if it is, what can be done differently to give more powers to the state? Or what kind of powers do the states need for them to be effective in tackling the security situation in their domains? Uh, yes, I think in one of our programs we'll discuss this. And I will still be emphasized that um, uh, both parties, from the state to the federal, we should not accept that as a public. Uh, because every uh, state government, they really have a budget to run security. Security is a business. But they see it as, uh, some governors see it as a very trivial issue. It is a business unit, just like any other thing they handle. In fact, it's the most serious business, but because without it, nothing can try. And I said it earlier, I said in some, uh, I know the former governor of Cardinal State have a particular commission which is dedicated to security and safety. Uh, for you to treat things seriously and commit budget, I don't see why this uh, federal, uh, the sub-state government cannot, cannot form a, 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 um, uh, a commission that has to handle security and safety in their state. Because that is a sign of due diligence. When they start having this department or a unit that will handle security and bring these professionals that will help them draw up blueprints, blueprints that will handle security in their state, the federal government will buy in because they are not going to work differently. But whereby they believe that the kind of system that they are operating right now is a system that existed in the military rule. The security structure is a system that existed in the military administration. We are still holding it. And we said we are practicing democracy. If truly, like you said in the other angle, if they have to make security work, then that you see it that we are in a democratic government, they should begin to release some of these things that are necessary for the state government to run. And when these things are committed to the federal and to the state government, then you have a platform that they will enable security in their various domains. It's not enough to act and to say complain that the federal government is not doing this. What platform do they have that they are handling security in a manner that will bring progress to their state? That is the question we should have for all of them. Hmm. But you said some things should be released to the state. What are some of those things that the state need that are still being held by federal government? Well, like, like, like you said, like some state governors would say that, uh, like, I will use the case study of um, Benway State. Uh, because I don't want to go too far. Let's use case studies of things we have seen. In Benway State, we saw the former governor crying out the first time, the first of the major mass, uh, mass murder they had in the state. He was crying for the former president, Buhari, to come to his aid. While he was going out of government, was another one that happened that was serious, where almost a community was burned down, and he was still relying on the government that they should declare a state of emergency. So, um, from this, there are some things that we cannot know from our own uh, angle, that is, as, uh, as public. We will not know the arrangement and how they interface with the federal government. The governors know this very well, and so when they are passing this blame, we should, uh, we should also ask the federal government that they should look into it. Since he's the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, he should look at it, those angles, those areas that they are complaining that they need this, they need this such that the whole state government have to rely on federal government to send armed forces in order to come and deal with a, a local community issue that normally it could raise up its own, uh, its own, uh, 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 its own uh, power, uh, firepower to like save the people. They say, like what I've heard from the past, there is always a complaint that the local authority, I mean the law enforcement and the military authority, will say the federal government have not given orders. Even in the face of violence, they will say the federal government has not given orders. So there is nothing they can do about it. So I think that is a major problem. Until the federal government release give an order that, look, there should be a state of emergency or the military should finish no action to help the government, the governors, 
there will be nothing done at that uh, at that moment. So I want, in my own in my own thinking, I think uh, such bureaucracy should be removed because it has to do with human life. Every minute they will wait, people will die. Every minute they delay, people are dying already. So they should remove that kind of bottleneck and allow things to flow. The federal government and the state government, they know what is happening. So they should help us in that angle and save life. Okay, some people, while talking about the, the fact that the state government should have more powers when it comes to controlling the security in their domains, have been afraid that sometimes when this power is given to the state government, it will be abused. That's why some of them even say uh, state police is not going to be a good thing because it will be just at the uh, mercy of the state governor. Do you support, we've talked about this before, but we are entering into 2024, so we have to re-emphasize the things we support and the things that we think there should be a review in our hearts and the hearts of the people who make policy. So what do you think about state police as we are entering 2024, and how do you think this can be controlled? Yes, uh, based on the crisis level we have had in Benway State, I will see you that. And some other state that we've, we've, we've had issues uh, regarding insecurity. Nigeria is a federal state, and we are practicing federalism. I think this federalism was copied from another nation, to so Nigeria. If we are practicing federalism, we should practice federalism. We should not be partial. It should be complete federalism. If you look at the state of the U.S., where we have some of these ideas we borrow uh, to run our government, they have, they have levels of uh, security structures. They have the ones that work at the local level. They have the state police, and they have the federal police. The FBI, the CIA, and all of that, even to the sheriff at the local level, they have them all working in sync in order to save guard their state. And when you look at that state, with so much population and with the largest state they have, they have been able to protect their environment. So if we are practicing a federal, we are practicing federalism, it should be complete, it should not be partial. I am in support of the state police. But when we have laws of engagement, like I say, we have rules and regulations that will guide them. It's not something you just implement without some guidelines. Some rules, some top rules to be followed. And when we follow laws, we follow guidelines, I'm sure that we'll achieve the same thing with what the foreign nations are doing for their people. Mm. Okay, what do you think should be the role of private security outfits as we enter to 2024? Uh, because uh, for a, a time now, it seems as if uh, private security outfits are not doing uh, optimally. They, 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 can pro they can contribute more, but we are not seeing that much. Uh, are there bottlenecks that are preventing them, or are there things that need to be done so that when we enter into 2024, we can utilize every, everybody uh, that is... Um, uh, that can offer some bit of security to us in our country? What role can private security outfits play as we enter into a new year? Yes, the role that the private security can play, uh, first of all, I would say that normally in the Nigerian police force, uh, they will tell you that they have deployed all their men protecting from um, high dignitaries, uh, say, uh, or celebrities and some of these people. I can tell you that in the private security, we have a lot of uh, integrated uh, ex-servicemen in the, in the private security sector who are trained in the use of arms. And so we want them to begin to release that kind of um, uh, executive protection or close protection or bodyguarding, some of those kind of uh, protection duties that uh, normally the police are handling and they see some of them even carrying back for their for women and all of that, they'll go back and all that. I think the private sector uh, has a lot of knowledgeable people, uh, people who also have a background in the law enforcement criminology that should handle some of those roles and release the men, especially the Nigerian police force, to go back to very sensitive duties so that they can help, they can have enough manpower uh, to man those places that they are having vulnerabilities. Uh, that is one thing. Another thing, the private security uh, should be engaged in training and retraining. We have a lot of skilled people, some are professors, some are PhD holders. Uh, it's not like in those days where it was a, a profession that was meant for dropouts. But I think it has highly improved. We have PhD holders, we have professors, all in the private security. 
And so in terms of training and retraining, they can help even at the national level. And uh, uh, another uh, capability that the private sector has that will help the national security is their widespread. They are widespread. They are in every street. They are in every location. There is no place that they don't have. They don't. They, they are not uh, printing. Definitely, they have a lot of intelligence that will help the government forces. So they should try to make them comfortable and find an enabling environment where they could share intelligence with them. This is another part. In terms of uh, security systems and technology, we are top notch. Uh, sorry, I'm using. I said the private security is top notch on this. They are uh, they are very knowledgeable in the latest technologies that could help the national security to improve. Not just the hard coded uh, manpower thing they are doing. Then it is convergence in security now is the in thing. Security convergence is the real thing everywhere in the world. You cannot gain a lot of. Um, you cannot win the battle by just using manpower. You need to include advanced technology. The private security are knowledgeable in this advanced technology and configuration. They can help them to build this into their operations. And secondly, or, or, or lastly, what I would say is that the government uh, should try that most businesses should be mandated or they should be a compulsory rule that enables them to put security on the ground. Most businesses don't have private security unless maybe they have a breach in their security system, like uh, stealing or loss of life. You see them rushing and calling on a security company to come. They are far as human life are in any premises, in any uh, premises, in any uh, 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 location or any business, private security should be engaged. So the law enforcement, especially the civil defense will help on this to implement this. This will all help in the national security development. Yeah, but uh, the gun laws in Nigeria do not uh, allow so many people to handle guns. Uh, how can they be of real help if they cannot handle guns? Uh, these people that you're talking about, the private security outfits and the personnel, uh, is it just for gathering of information? Because, for instance, if a school is being raided by bandits uh, or kidnappers to take some people and the security uh, personnel that are there are unarmed, there is little or nothing that they can do to protect these people. Will you also advocate that these people be armed? Yes, you see, uh, where we are operating from, um, I think we want to remain in the colonial period. Uh, when the, the police uh, the police officers then were given buttons, they were carrying buttons because there was no violence in the country. Uh, so uh, today, when civil defense came on board, they were not armed. But along the line, just like what you have picked up, they found out that there is need for them to be armed based on their role. The private security is always a large business enterprise with several departments or several units. I think the unit that will handle those protection, there should be a guideline for them. There should be a strict guideline from the national security. If any organization, any private security would like to buy into the idea of close protection, they should directly and strictly supervise by the national security. So this will help. We are not saying that they should give guns to every private security officer. Whoever that is capable and have gone through the training, they should be trained from their own level to handle weapons in that area so that they can release the, the, uh, the Nigerian police of that duty or they can release them of that duty, align them to do to carry out sensitive national assignments. Mm -hmm. They should not be allowed or they should not be armed without training. They should be trained. They should be documented. There should be a deep background uh, investigation on those that will be doing that kind of duty because they are going to carry arms like the, the national law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So there should be a thorough background, including uh, uh, biometric checks, so that there will be deterrent. Those that will go into it, they know that they are, oh, they are, they are closely monitored. And I'm sure they will not desire to do other things, other, or anything evil, because the federal government and even the state government or the national, they have their data. Uh, that is one thing they can do. Okay, so I do understand that security, this is the final one now, I do understand that security has to do with the person securing and the person who is being secured. So that's the people. We've been talking 
to people who need to secure uh, orders. And let's talk to the people that we need to secure, or the security people need to secure. That's the ordinary citizen. As we go into a new year, I know that this is still October, but before you say Jack Robinson, we're in 2024. So what should the people, what should the role of the people be like? Uh, if Because we all desire this security to be better than how it is now. So what role can the people play to bring this about? Finally, now. Okay, we seem to have lost the audio from uh, Mr. Aiga, but he has been sharing with us uh, what to look out for, what we need to do as we enter into 2024 to make sure that security is better than now. Uh, well, we'll just take a break. We thank him in, in absentia. We'll just take a break now, and when we return, we'll be talking about NLC issues. Stay with us.